So hello, welcome to this second annual Schomburg Center Literary Festival, Reading the African Diaspora. Tonight's program, Between the Lines, with Coleman Center Fellow, Nicole R. Fleetwood, author of Marking Time, Art in the, Ma in the Age of Mass Incarceration, is hosted in partnership with the New York Public Libraries, the Dorothy and Lewis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers, and the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture. I am Novella Ford, the Associate Director of Public Programs and Exhibitions at the Schomburg Center, where we are celebrating 95 years as one of the world's leading cultural institutions devoted to the research, preservation, and exhibition of materials focused on global Black experiences. Our archive boasts over 11 million items that illuminate the richness of Black history and culture, and we have made some of those items available digitally as we continue to navigate the quarantine imposed by COVID-19. Please visit our website at schomburg.org for more details about what's happening at the Schomburg Center, how you can conduct your research, um, and many of the other things that you are interested in at the Schomburg. We have made them available online. Like many book festivals, we had to reimagine a block-long, multi-stage outdoor festival as a virtual one with your favorite writers and the opportunity to discover more books to add to your shelves. This week, we have 35 authors and moderators sharing narratives from the US and UK to West Africa and Jamaica. You can visit the LitFest website at schombergcenterlitfest.org to see the full schedule. Just to give you a sense of what's coming up, tomorrow we will explore the work of Audre Lorde with writers Roxane Gay, Tracy K. Smith, and Mahogany Brown, who uh, are affiliated with republications of some of Audre Lorde's work, as well as a new selected work edited by Roxane Gay. On Thursday, we have YA authors Dean Adda from the UK, debut author and National Book Award long list author Candace Elo, seasoned author Jacqueline Woodson, and we'll also be exploring Black comic books. And then just to give you a sense, on Saturday, we kick it off with Dr. Eddie Glaude Jr., who is the author of Begin Again, James Baldwin's America and its Urgent Lessons for Our, Na for our Own. The festival continues to expand the Schomburg's long tradition of championing authors of African descent from across the globe and publications that celebrate Black history and culture. It is not often that you can expect to find home in a virtual space. But tonight, Nicole Fleetwood finds herself sharing space with the Coleman Center and the Schomburg Center, scholarly homes where she has been a fellow and a scholar in residence. We are so proud of her work. And I remember the first time I met Nicole, she was telling me all about this work that, is now, that has now been produced in this book, Marking Time, as well as an exhibition that you can see at MoMA PS1. I am so proud of you, Nicole, and thank you for always saying yes to the Schomburg Center. Writer and art critic Jessica Lynn wrote that Marking Time is itself an urgently political text whose author does not mask her investment in an abolitionist framework that might lead to a world without prisons. Dr. Fleetwood will be in conversation with historian Elizabeth Hinton, and then we will have time for questions drawn from the audience. Please use the chat to submit your questions at any time, and we will do our best to get to as many as possible before the program is over. Just a reminder that you can order Marking Time at the Schomburg Shop or through the Schomburg Shop at schomburgshop.com. We are recording this program for the archive, but you, the audience, will not be part of the recording. Please be mindful of your fellow audience members in the chat, and certainly thank you for tuning in. Now I turn it over to Salvatore Scabona, who is the Sue Ann and John Weinberg Director of the New York Public Libraries, Dorothy and Louis B. Coleman Center for Scholars and Writers. Thanks, Novella. My name is Salvatore Scabona, uh, Director of the Coleman Center. I appreciate your uh, introduction there. Uh, Nicole Fleetwood was, of course, a fellow at the Schomburg, at the uh, Coleman Center with me, um, actually four years ago. Uh, the Coleman Center is delighted to co-present this event with our colleagues at the Schomburg Center and the Schomburg Center Literary Festival. As some of you know, the Coleman Center selects 15 fellows a year for a nine month term. Fellows receive an office in the center, which is located inside the Stephen A. Schwartzman building of the NYPL at Fifth Avenue and 42nd Street. 
It in, the fellowship includes intensive access to our collections and a living stipend so that fellows can focus exclusively on their work during their fellowships. The fellows are some of the very best and most promising academics, independent scholars, poets, playwrights, journalists, dramatists, artists, and fiction writers at work today. Anyone interested in applying is welcome to visit the Coleman Center's website and submit an application. But the deadline for next year is September 25th. So uh, it's approaching fast. Look, look at the website right away if you're interested. Nicole Fleetwood will speak tonight with Elizabeth Hinton. Elizabeth Hinton is Associate Professor of History and African American Studies and Professor of Law at Yale University. She's the author of From the War on Poverty to the War on Crime, which has received numerous awards, including the Ralph Waldo Emerson Prize from the Phi Beta Kappa Society, and was named to the New York Times 100 Notable Books of 2016. She recently won an Andrew Carnegie Fellowship from the Carnegie Corporation and the Rosalind Abramson Award for Excellence and Sensitivity in Teaching Undergraduates from Harvard University. She speaks, of course, tonight with my friend Nicole R. Fleetwood, who is Professor of American Studies and Art History at Rutgers University. Nicole's work on art and mass incarceration has been featured at the Aperture Foundation, the Zimmerle Museum of Art, the Eastern State Penitentiary Historic Site, and the Cleveland Public Library. And her exhibitions have been praised by The Nation, The New York Times, The New Yorker, and The Village Voice. She's also the author of On Racial Icons and of Troubling Vision, which won the Laura Romero Prize from the American Studies Association. She worked on marking time during her Coleman Center Fellowship in 2016-2017 as the ACLS NYPL Fellow. I'm very proud to introduce to you, Nicole Fleetwood. Good evening, everyone. So I, this is like such a treat, I have to say, because Novella's right. Novella and Salvatore, thank you both for those beautiful introductions. And thank you both, your friends, and I love being in community with you. Um, I'm at home in Harlem, but the Schoenberg Center is just like a few blocks away. So I do feel like I'm there. I, I feel the energy of the Schoenberg. And it's also really special for me to be here tonight in this virtual space with Elizabeth Hinton, whose work really inspires me. And before COVID set us all in, <laughs> stuck in our homes, um, Elizabeth and I were gonna do an event at the Coleman Center. It was gonna be um, the very first event for Marking Time. And so I'm glad that we're able to make this happen um, six months later. So um, thank you all for joining us. And I'm really excited about being a part of the Schoenberg Literary Festival. I'm just gonna talk a few minutes about Marking Time and um, show some images. And then we'll, um, um, I'll introduce uh, Elizabeth and we'll be in conversation for a while before questions. Um, incarceration has reshaped my family in my hometown in Southwest Ohio. This is a picture of me with my cousin, Alan, who was imprisoned for 21 years and his mother, my aunt Sharon. Countless relatives have been arrested and detained. Some have been convicted and sentenced and others held indefinitely and then let go. Studies of the carceral state offer insightful explanations of what many of us experience in our own communities, the mass removal of people we love, along with the permanent stigma on imprisoned people and their families. As I came of age in the 80s and 90s, people around me, mainly young black teens, but also older men and women, were shipped off to prison at such a rate that their sudden disappearance and long-term absence became the norm. Boys my age who went to school with me were there and then gone, some never to return. They became invisible to us and hard to reach because of all the mechanisms prisons use to separate people from their families and communities. We had no words to describe the utter devastation, the despair. Opening our local newspaper was often cause for pain and embarrassment as photographs of people we knew and loved were seen in handcuffs all too often. At the same time, there were other images being produced about mass incarceration. Images that rarely made the news and had little public visibility. 
They were a, diver a diverse assortment of artworks and illustrations that came from inside prisons, studio photos, handmade greeting cards, drawings, and other pieces of art by incarcerated people. The visiting rooms where we sat with our imprisoned loved ones often displayed paintings, miniatures, and sculptures. These objects were not new forms of prison art, but as the size of the prison population boomed, so did the visual culture of mass incarceration. Marking time grows out of a decade of these practice, of researching and archiving these practices. It is about the centrality of prisons in contemporary art and culture and the robust world of art making inside US prisons. When I started the project, I set out to engage the politics of this art making in prisons and more expansively art as politics in an era of extensive human caging. Throughout this book and the exhibitions and public programming around the book, I highlight the compulsion to make, to create and to produce meaning under brutal and austere circumstances. There are lessons here developed by people in prison about how to create, to forge relations, and to embody and represent one's life under unimaginable conditions. And so we learn about a society that relies on punitive confinement as a solution to a myriad of social, economic, political, ecological, and health crises. Marking time has been made possible by the transformative vision of freedom, justice, and belonging of an amazing group of currently and formerly incarcerated artists and their loved ones and allies. They inspire me every day. Our freedom is interdependent. Prisons, indefinite detention, parole, co concentration camps, they exist in as much as we allow them to. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to bring on stage, our virtual stage, Elizabeth Hinton. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Nicole. It's so good to be here with you. It's such an exciting honor. And as you mentioned, one that I've been anticipating for a while. Um, I just want to thank the Schomburg Center and, and the Coleman Center once again for, um, for bringing us together and for sponsoring this event. I, I don't think this conversation, I mean, the, the conversation about mass incarceration is always really critical, but now um, in the context of the pandemic and widespread state-sanctioned state violence and protest, um, against policing and criminalization, the, the book and the conversation um, has grown even more urgent. And I don't think I've had an opportunity um, to thank you for writing this book. It really is a tremendous and magnificent achievement and um, one that I think captures something about incarceration and its stakes that hasn't been um, quite translated in this way before. So thank you um, for your work. It's, it's so you. incredible. And thank you, because as I was writing, okay, so as I was at the Coleman Center, I was reading your book. So it's all like coming home. And I just, and I didn't know you at the time, I met you later, but I felt like I was like, oh, like, you know, when you read a book and you just feel like you're in intimate dialogue with someone. So it's it's great to actually now be in intimate dialogue with you, not just through your words. Well, that's how I felt too, when I, when I was reading the book. And also, I mean, intimate dialogue in terms of, you know, how we're thinking about and responding to and building knowledge and a movement to transcend um, the current mass incarceration society that we're in. But also, you know, when I got to the last chapter where you talk about um, the visiting room and the photographs in prison, um, that really spoke to me in a way that I wasn't necessarily expecting. Um, because, you know, having been, been a part of those family portraits and having, you know, a collection of Polaroids from my visits with family in prison, I hadn't, you gave me the tools to understand that in an entirely different way. And I think that's really important for families and loved ones um, of people who are incarcerated. So I want to talk about the ways in which um, my historical work and the, and the work of the artists that you highlight in the book intersect. But first, um, you know, you mentioned that this was, that the book was an outgrowth of 10 years of research. And I'm just wondering, like, how did you, how did you put this together? How did you cultivate the, your relationships with artists? And um, what were some of the biggest challenges that you faced in working with um, incarcerated artists and highlighting prison art um, 
And I want to say like um, the pictures of my, I showed you a picture of my, me with Alan and, and my aunt Sharon and thankfully Alan is out of prison. But the project started with me like, cause I would make sure I flew to Ohio at least once a year to see him at the time. I think, you know, I was in California getting my PhD then I was in New York, but that was very important for me to mark that time with him. And I, and I just remember on one of those visits leaving and just feeling that like there had to be something more. Um, and of course there's a love between us, but it just, I wanted another way of mapping this trajectory, this experience of loving someone who's like held captive. And at the time, Alan, Alan was 18 when he was sentenced to life. Like, um, and, and you know, it was a, uh, like 15 to life or 18 to life, I can't remember. So, but it was one of those things where he had gone up before parole multiple occasions before he was eventually released. And so I actually just started with a set of images. And honestly, I did not know where that was going to take me, but I just started with, I wanted to find, I'm, I'm someone visual, but I'm, I, I understand things through words. Like I understand my emotions when I can put them into words. And I wanted to like figure out what it meant for me and for him, like for the family to have these images circulating amongst us and to have them to be so rich with love and possibility, but also just utter devastation and not knowing if the conditions of us having to come together only under these, this like the gaze of like the prison staff was the only way that we were going to be able to move in, in one move together. Because one of the things that became very clear to me is that, oh, it's like when you're in prison, you don't move with your family. You know, and, and that's something we just, it's so quotidian. We take for granted that we are walking to the grocery store with someone we love or we're like having a meal or, and so it was such a frenetic energy whenever we get up and walk to that, to that backdrop together to take a picture. And I was like, in 21 years, it's the only time I'm moving with Alan was going towards that backdrop. Mm -hmm. And so I had a real, like, I just had this palpable desire to try to find language to capture the emotions around that. And that's how the project started. It was really wanting to, and it took me like three years to write that first chapter. And it came out as an article in public culture, but it was like really struggling with the language. And, and part of it was me just coming public, like talking about it to people. And every time I talked about it, like actually processing the, the, all the emotions around that. And it just connected me to all these other people who had other archives. And these are ar archives of like utter devastation, but also utter creativity. Like it's people experiencing the worst thing that possibly could happen to them and the family having to like figure out how to come together and love that person as, these, as, this, as they're experiencing their entire life as punishment, which unless you've been in prison, you don't know what it means to like go to the bathroom and that's, you're being punished, going to bed and being, and so that was for me also this existential thing of like, you know, everything Alan is doing for 21 years is in, uh, is, is the state enacting punishment on him. Um, so I was grappling with all of that. And, and I wanna say that literally project started with me just thinking about these images that I've been carrying around since 1994 of my incarcerated loved ones. And it grew beyond anything that I could imagine it being. So it, part of the, the growth is this concept of, or at least the, the way that you um, in some ways organize um, the ideas about the power of this art in the first in that first chapter is through this concept of carceral aesthetics, um, which you define as the production of art under the conditions of unfreedom. So those are those um, artists who kind of practice efforts to critique and reimagine systems of surveillance and punishment. So um, you know, in thinking about ways in which our work intersects and in which um, scholarship intersects with the art that's being produced um, through this aesthetic. I'm wondering um, how you see this concept and, and the work in general as kind of building upon the both the, the, the Black radical tradition um, and freedom struggles and also the how does it speak to the growing field of um, carceral studies and scholarship on mass incarceration. So that's, I know that's a big question. Thank you. And when I, I want to say like, there's like, there's no, there's no romanticism in 
making art in prison. Like everything about prisons suck. Like I don't want to make it sound, you know, like I love the art that is in my book and I love the art that incarcerated people have made, but I don't want to at all make it sanction that space of just of horrific violence and brutality. And um, so I want to just preface what everything I'm saying about the art because I am um, to completely wild and I love what what in, imprisoned people do to like make space for themselves and to like claim selfhood through you know while faced with such brutal austere uh, conditions and and just quotidian violence every day in and out um uh, you know, as you asked me that question, I was thinking about Simone Brown's really brilliant book on um, called Dark Matters, and it's thinking about surveillance from uh, slavery to now, and this idea of undersight, or like, you know, what is the line of vision for people who are held captive? One of the things that was so clear to me around writing this book is that prisons are all about regulating what we can see we, the people who are outside of prison, we who love people who are in prison, we who are like part of what um, Michelle Brown calls penal spectatorship, we watch in a way that actually reproduces the logic of prisons. We who are imprisoned, we who are in solitary confinement, I claim all these forms of we because we all have this kind of very limited access to the larger, the larger stakes of prisons, you know, where our vision is very much framed by what some theorists call carceral visuality. It's completely structured through the state. And that's why, like, even like, if the idea of the panopticon becomes this really like uh, this, you know, metaphor, this architecture for understanding prisons and the power of vision, right? The power of vision and surveillance to hold people within. And so I was thinking of, you know, what the kind of sight lines and the ways of creating and practicing when you're locked inside, you know, and when maybe your only access to outside of your cell is the porthole that you're looking out if you're in solitary confinement. And I realized even as I was kind of imagining and speculating this, that I was, and loving people who were in prison, I was still, my vision was so limited about the possibility and so I open with this piece, this art, and I don't know if we can pull up the slides again. If, if not, it's okay, but it's the second slide. It's by an artist, Ronnie Goodman, and it's a self-portrait of, of him inside of an art workshop in San Quentin. And I had seen that image three or four years before I, I was able to talk to Ronnie about it. And I imagined it as something that was so other than how he described it to me. Mm -hmm. like his sight lines as someone who was, had been a long-term person in, in um, San Quentin and how he said, oh, this is not just about me painting myself and painting the studio, but it's about me like uh, practices of discernment. I was curating the space. He said, I didn't like the things that were on the wall. So I was curating what I wanted to see in that space. So is this whole, le another level of like, not like critical engagement of like, um, kind of mastering and you know control over the space that was really controlling him, and I realized in terms of like my method that I would that there that there's no um, conventional academic method that will lead me to that knowledge that I had to be a student and listen to people who have actually experienced that to even have any access to that information. So he was describing all these works around that not only, and I didn't think even to the level of which he's also reproducing all of this art. So this is not just a self portrait, but it's multiple paintings within the painting itself, right? Where he's that he's written. So the level of sophistication and, and planning and just uh, foresight that goes into this kind of work, you know, kind of blew my mind in terms of my own limitations and how I was framing um, the possibilities of imprisoned people. So wait, just to clarify, Mr. Goodman explained, he, he described to you on the phone or in the visiting room what the what the painting looks, looked like years before you actually had a chance to see it. So I had seen it and I had done art historical analysis of what was happening in it. I see, I see. It blew my mind. He's like, no, actually what I was doing is I was curating and I was, painting the things that I wanted to have, that I was bringing in proximity to my body. He said he was bringing certain things mm -hmm. to him that he placed more value over in that space. So he's re-curating, re-kind of defining that space where he's held captive. 
Wow, thank you for that. That gives even like a even more layered uh, interpretation. Mind blowing. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really great. Um, so I guess along those lines, you know, one of the things that I really appreciated about the book is the ways in which you highlight just like how ingenious um, prisoners are in just like creating things that enable survival and and just like the networks of um, of fellowship and love that help um, sustain um, community and 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 sustain people while they're while they're serving time. And so one of the things that I thought was really important and interesting about the work is um, the way that you know you write you're writing about prison as like penal space and penal time and penal matter um, and as a site of both restraint, right, and repression, but also possibility. Um, space is constricted, supplies are limited, of course, and certain materials are prohibited. Um, but there, you know, this ingenuity continues to um, lead to a, a flourishing artistic community. Can you talk some about those, those possibilities and restraints and the ways in which artists navigate? Um, right. Artists you in, in that condition? So you were asking me about like the, and this kind of gets at, I didn't answer all of the first question around also like the black radical tradition mm -hmm. and like, um, um, you know, the, the work on prisons and carceral studies. And so, and this also, you know, I was working on many of these chapters at the Coleman Center. And at some point I went to back to the Schoenberg because, and this is a shout out to the Schoenberg's archives. They have these incredible archives from the Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, BECC. And that was one of the very first uh, organizations that really uh, tried, you know, created this kind of, uh, of what this generation, modern generation of prison arts programs. I mean, there's always been like rehabilitative arts or art in confinement, but BECC, they were like, they had a critique of the museums as these places of exclusion, the history of museums excluding black, excluding black artists, but also the muse history of museums, uh, you know, ter hoarding and pillaging and putting people of color on display, right? So it's so like multiple cr critique and it was at the same time as the Attica uprising and it was total logical progression for them to go from museums to prison like that made sense to them because these are spaces where ideas about human valuation are uh some sedimented they're 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 built around the architecture right like the architecture of prison is all about the type of populations we dehumanize and we devalue but that we also want to extract value from right yeah. and okay. um, museums are all about this kind of elevation of a certain stat of, of a certain kind of person right of a certain type of aesthetic that reproduces notions of modernity of western civilization and the like and bcc saw that linkage in out of the attica uprising and started and so there's great archives i recommend everyone look at it um at the schoenberg that started with people vo artists volunteering and they were black as part of the black radical tradition and and it was not a kind of even an inside outside logic because so much of the like most interesting political theory was coming out of prisons, mm -hmm. right? And you know that because you're a historian of this, right? That like some of the like, you know that people were reading George Jackson people, right? So this there's this, it's not uh, that knowledge wasn't coming from one way in, that it was, it was much more, there was a porosity in terms of ideas and creativity that was taking place. And one of the um, oldest artists in my book, um, Ojuri Lutalo, who's a black, member of the Black Liberation Army, he he says he goes, he went in as just like, a, he calls himself a common thug, like it just a, he was a poor guy in Asbury Park, you know, and he ended up, and he becomes radicalized by, uh, by the Black Panther Party inside prison. And then he takes that knowledge out, right? So it's, it was, it's very interesting to me how the, history and legacy of a, of a radical curriculum and a radical aesthetic that um, has a lot of seeds in prison, but I don't want to limit to prison, right? Because it's like this relationship between um, the street, between itinerant public spaces where Black people can gather and plan and 
prisons and punitive confinement where there is like what Fred Mullen and Stefano Hardy talks about, like a, a fugitive planning that takes place often while people are watching, while there's an overseer, there's oversight. And the type of art that's being made in contemporary prisons, there's a similar kind of practice where people are doing sometimes really radical, interesting things. And sometimes the guards are looking, but they don't even know what they're seeing, right? Because they have a whole logic about what, what's, a, what's available and what's possible, possible um, among imprisoned people. And one example is like Jesse Crimes, who's a white artist. This is also for me was really great to learn about like, how so much of aesthetic production and art making in prisons also defies the kind of racial apartheid and the racial logics of prison, which is all about isolating people into racial categories so that people do not come together and, and make demands of the prison itself. And art becomes a space where you see really cross-racial and cross-ethnic coalition building that, I, that was for me incredibly inspiring. And so Jesse Crimes is an artist who, you know, over the course of three years, uh, created this huge 15 feet by 40 feet uh, art piece of art on 39 prison bed sheets that he did through the help of other artists, of uh, artists, non-white artists who were helping to facilitate the passage of this, these works. So it is a kind of like safe passage in and out. So there were so many interesting things that were happening that I learned from people that speak to the history of captive people resisting captivity and, and the dehumanization that comes with confinement. What do you think, what do you think the, the artists can tell us about the experience of incarceration that, um, that can't be captured in other ways, that can't be captured by firsthand accounts, that can't be captured by the history books? Right, and, I, and I, it's so interesting because I was also reading like, um, I think your, um, your colleague, at, yeah, I think it's Caleb Smith, who he writes about literature in prisons. And, and so some people were talking about the history of, you know, prisons and the kind of reform movement, right? And that part of the whole idea that prisons are about reform, which we know since day one that <laughs> prisons reform very little, but that part of that logic is that uh, people who have been who have done wrong, wrongdoers need to create a new narrative of self. And I bring this up because there's this really robust uh, genre of prison literature that um, in some ways contribute to play with this idea of like a narration of self. Um, and some and you do get stories often of people who talk about being illiterate or semi-literate and then learning to read in prison. And so there's a there's a kind of trajectory that is not uncommon, right? That we see in, in a, a range of books from, from prison. And I feel like uh, visual art really kind of complicates that, complicates the kind of like the um, primacy we, that we place on, place on a certain kind of narrative convention that we expect from imprisoned people about how they define themselves. And I think part of it is the actual materiality of the kind of invention that comes out of like in prison, people talk about like uh, procurement and it's taking state goods, state materials and repurposing it. So it's like literally taking state property and doing something else with it while also being defined as state property. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in prison people, for example, tell me like part of the even the whole uh, currency around prison tattoos is that like, you know, it's a violation of prison code, partly because it's actually defacing state property that the body of the imprisoned person is state property, right? So it's really like complicating mm -hmm. um, the idea of state property, ownership of property rights. Um, and so much of the art making is about taking material, the materiality and the spatiality that's meant to hold them captive and to render them uh, not a productive person in society and to use that for their own repurposing. Yeah, the, um, the audience might remember in the slideshow at the beginning, the back bend, which I noticed in a different way, the back bend piece, which is a, um, is a cafeteria table or a visiting room table, tables that have been molded. So that's a- 
thank you for bringing that up because it for me um one of the one of the things that I really wanted to make clear in the book, and I think it might be even more visually apparent in the exhibition at PS1 that opened um, just a few days ago, is that the book is not just about people in prison, but it's about a range of art making and aesthetics that engage with the carceral state. So the majority of the artists have been in prison or are currently in prison, but I also look at several conceptual artists like Sable Lee Smith, has not been in prison. She's an incredible contemporary artist who uh, is on faculty at Columbia in the art school. But she has, since the age of 10, her, she's been visiting her father in prison. So her work is all about like the fragmentation of like black family life, black identity based on the carceral state in ways that are not as obvious. So for her, she's working with the kind of materiality and that is like the visiting room, mm -hmm. seating area that she's turned into this really interesting sculpture. And she does that a lot with where she's kind of deconstructing objects that, objects that are associated with the prison state um, and it, at the service of art. And I wanted her to be in conversation with other imprisoned people who are doing that same thing from the side of captivity. And maybe they have more like kind of li more limited access, but they might also have another a totally different kind of archive, but it's a similar type of practice of making us aware of the expansiveness uh, of prison and the kind of cool tedious nature of prisons by taking things that are familiar and making them and de defamiliarizing them to us. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate the distinctions that you make um, throughout the book between, I guess, the different spaces and contexts that artists are creating um, this carceral aesthetic. And one that was really striking to me um, were the um, artists who were who were in solitary confinement. And to and to you know the to me there seems to be um, in terms of their aesthetic some differences between their work and the. Um, the artists who might be in in general pop or on the outside. Can you talk a little bit about how the conditions of solitary um, shape the kind of art um, that's produced? And, and one of the things I want to say is that solitary confinement is so widely used in the United States and I, you know and it's and it's our responsibility to know more about it mm -hmm. like because we are allowing the state to literally torture tens of thousands of people. And it's really hard to keep track of how many people are in solitary confinement. Solitary Watch, which is a watchdog organization does some great work. And so I wanna shout them out. But what I wanna say is that there's a, there are thousands and thousands of people who are in solitary confinement for not why we think people go to solitary confinement. We often think that it's a punishment within a punitive system that you've done something wrong in prison and then you get thrown to the hole. But no, it's so commonly used to isolate, for example, people who are under the age of 18 who are in adult prison. So it's considered like protective custody. It's often used against transgender people who've been wrongly classified in a, in a prison that is not their gender assignment, right? And so they're often isolated in solitary confinement. Um, it's used against... Um, sometimes political prisoners, radical prisoners. So one of the artists in my chapter on solitary confinement is a Jory Lutalo who spent 22 years in solitary confinement, not because he did something wrong once he was in prison, it's because his ideas were too radical. And the prison literally said, we are afraid that you're going to influence the general population. So they kept him in isolation and he had very little access to art. And so he, you know, he used his own like mugshot. He used uh, legal documents that he had access to to uh, advocate on, on, on his own behalf. He used, uh, you know, pencils and pens and and you know Elmer's glue, just very simple to create like hundreds and hundreds of collages that he would send out to the prison watch program, and they would use it to advocate um, on his behalf. You know, and, and two of the artists, I was just thinking about this um, earlier today that two of the artists in that chapter, um, you know, they, they died. They're no like this, it, it, for me, like 
as much as I, you know, I find art incredibly inspiring, I don't want this to be like a story that's the story of uplift or a trajectory that's a, that, you know, the stakes are really high and everyone doesn't survive. Ronnie Goodman, whose work we opened with in San Quentin, Ronnie Goodman was an, he was released from prison and was unhoused in San Francisco. And during COVID, he, he was rendered more and more vulnerable and he died a month ago in, on the streets of San Francisco. And we know that prisons right now are a hot spot for COVID. That that you know, several of the artists I'm in contact with, like Mark Lafney, whose work is on the cover of my book, he's been on lockdown for months straight. You know, he's been, and that's been the approach that many prisons are taking to people in prison to stop the spread is to just keep people in solitary confinement for 23 hours a day. And we know that makes people more vulnerable to like all kinds of health and mental health crises. Is your sense that uh, the production of prison art has uh, slowed in the context of COVID? Like how are the artists that you know and the art, art, artistic collectives navigating those lockdowns and the threat that COVID poses um, in an incredibly vulnerable prison setting? Well, I mean, I really appreciate that question. And, and I want to uh, turn it around a little bit to, by, by saying that some of the artists who were, who are, were in prison and now are out mm -hmm. are the most fearless activists around getting people out of prison now. So it's like this entire, this incredible community of directly impacted people who are working like it day in, day out to get people out. And one is Mary Baxter, who I think is on uh, tonight. She's a, she, she's a great ally. And she's someone who like was, has been involved in like um, the um, free black mamas, like the bail campaign. She'll go to the county jail um, in Philadelphia and, you know, bail people out. There's James Hoff, who was in prison in Pennsylvania for 27 years, and he's now the artist in residence for the um, DA's office for the city of Philadelphia, and he's doing all this public art, making people aware of the crisis of COVID inside prisons. Um, there's Die Jim Crow, which is a nonprofit organization around uh, sound and art, and they've been sending PPE into imprisoned people. So I feel like th the people who've been in prison are the ones who really know what the stakes are that you can't, there's no social distancing in prison. There is no access to like hand sanitizer on, you know, whenever you need it, you, you know, you're immobilized. You're often um, both isolated and overcrowded, right? So you're in sometimes in a dorm with 50, 60, 70 other people. Um, and, but you're, so you have no control over that, like crowd control, but you're also isolated at the same that you're overcrowded. So, so those conditions are rife for like prisons becoming these like mass death machines. And one of the things that I noticed, you know, you know, the first couple of months in the spring, people were talking more and more about prisons, but it got quieter and quieter and states that start to have stopped counting. There's a reasons why states do not want to count because states don't want to be accountable for the mass sickness and deaths that are happening in prison. So it's by, it's literally like by not taking stock, not taking account that it's almost, it's rendered almost invisible. So important. And I could ask you a million more questions, but I do want to open it up uh, to our audience who I know have some amazing questions of their own and we can all be in conversation. Um, Okay, so I guess the first one we'll take is um, if you could speak a little bit about your work at the Schomburg Center and the New York Public Library and what did you find uh, while you were there? So I mentioned the Coleman Center and the BECC archives. The, the, so the BECC archives are really important, Black Emergency Cultural Coalition, because it does document one of the earliest known prison arts programs that was volunteer run and is by like these incredible like very well-known black radical artists many of them based in harlem who were doing things protesting museums but they're also super active they also created this the attica book which is in a gorgeous book and it's a limited edition but uh, the schoenberg has a copy of it that was a um coalition of artists who were responding to the attica uprising including um, people who were survivors of the Attica uprising. Um, at, the, at the Coleman Center, when I was at the um, Stephen Schwartzman Library, they have these incredible 
um, really early images of, um, of New York State prisons as they're being built. Um, and, you know, we, when I worked with Aperture um, to do Prisonation, which is about the history of photography and photography's role in imprisonment, we were able to use some of them, but many of them have not been seen. So, I mean, the, um, that archive is incredible. They also have uh, the angle light, which, um, uh, which is this incredible newsletter that was started by imprisoned people at Angola. And there's like a lot of radical thinking that was happening, taking place and that was being shared among imprisoned people. Um, so there's some really great resources at both places. In thinking about um, the BECC's work, one person wanted to know if you've been able to encourage prison staff to offer art classes or to teach about art, et cetera. Like, has your work and the well-deserved attention it's received helped to bolster prison art programs elsewhere? I appreciate that question because I do, like this project to me is about, um, about collectivity. Like, yeah, I wrote this book, but I wrote it in conversation with literally hundreds of people. I interviewed over 70 artists several organizations such as like the William James Association put me in touch with um, imprisoned people or formerly imprisoned people. But I also do want to say I have a chapter, it's chapter five, that's called Fraught Imaginaries, where I look at the politics of collaboration with imprisoned people. And, and, and I take some organizations to task without like naming or trying to like, it's not about naming and shaming, but it's about thinking really critically about what it means to collaborate with people who legally cannot consent. So this, we're, we have to go in, when we're doing collaborative projects with imprisoned people, we have to go in like really clear and like really acknowledging in the same way that indigenous people say that we have to do land recognition, that we need to acknowledge where we are and the, the practices of theft and dispossession that's involved. Whenever we are, involved in uh, some type of collaboration or way of um, whatever our privilege I think is on display and we are working with communities that have been dispossessed or imprisoned or have suffered as a result you can't go in without acknowledging that so often you know organizations will say we're giving light to we're giving voice to we're collaborating with and there's no acknowledgement of that fact that like these, some organizations are bringing in grants, they're making money, artists are getting reputations, and often the imprisoned people are left in prison, right, without, without much to, to show for it, and some of them will never be released from prison. So I think the whole idea of collaborating and doing prison arts programs have to be thought of in much, with like a much more critical lens because, you know, often we think of art in these ways that really play into kind of a liberal capitalist ideology and not think about like how they how these art programs can continue to perpetuate inequality and how they often just become like a, a, a really um, pretty face for the carceral state. So I really, you know, I, I, I wanted to like recognize the labor of the people who are working in these organizations because a lot of people are working very hard and they're really doing things because they believe in a cause, but also really thinking critically about are these structures in place to reproduce carcerality? Or are these structures in place to actually radically reimagine what belonging looks like in a world where we don't have some people free and other people unfree? Is there a way to use these organizations to re radically transform what justice and repair look like and to actually really deal with harm systemically and interpersonal harm, community harm, you know, and, and harm, systemic harm, right? Like that, is there a way that we can reimagine how these organizations can come together and show other ways of making community and, and belonging to community? Mm -hmm. that, is such, that is such a crucial and important point. Um, I guess along those lines, one person wanted to know uh, what programs or efforts can we get involved in to empower art making by people who are justice involved? Um, okay, so, you know, I mean, one of the things I think that we um, have to just do is like, and like you can talk on this way more than I can because of your research, but like it's, 
I don't like using words like moral. Like I think it's ethically, it's an ethical, it's an ethical problem that we choose not to know about prisons. Mm -hmm. It's it's a real ethical, it's a, it's an ethical issue that we choose to ignore the global heat the crisis that's taking place, the ecological crisis. It's, Mm -hmm. In the same way, it's it's an ethical problem for us to act like we to live a life where we can overlook the fact that we can say over two million people are in prison when actually there are many millions of people who are more impacted by imprisonment than those those people we can document, right? Because we know that there are all kinds of spaces where people are held captive. There is digital imprisonment. There's all these ways that people are literally tethered to a very violent system that continues to re uh, reproduce their vulnerability and their their uh, you know their limited outcomes. And the fact that so I think the first thing we have to do is like really wake up and to and to and to um, look and pay attention and to realize that the way that we vote, the way that we engage police, the way that we deal with crises on our streets actually can contribute. You know what I mean? That we can find ways in our very local lives to not continue to foster a system that is about a predatory policing, incapacitation, and eventually death of yeah. vulnerable populations. Mm -hmm. So art is one thing, but I think it's how we engage in community. When we see someone who looks like they're having a crisis on the streets, what, what do we do? Mm -hmm. and often our first, our go-to is the police when the police should not be our go-to, yeah. right? That, and part of it is us creating other systems for dealing with moments of crisis and harm and hurt in our communities. Yeah, and, and that police and punitive systems are not the way to respond to, to that harm and to those inequalities. Um, this person has a question that kind of uh, was one that I wanted to raise, so I'm gonna ask you now, um, which is, so part of it is about the experience of people who have, you know, who have, have done art in prison and, and, how, and how their lives of, as artists continue on the outside. And this person asks, um, for those who have, who have returned, have they been able to find exhibits or shows for their work? Um, what might some of the obstacles that they encounter be? I really appreciate that question. And many of them are exhibiting artists. Uh, many of them are winning grants and fellowships. And actually two of the artists in the book, um, Russell Craig and Jesse Crimes are involved with um, uh, Open Philanthropies and the Soze Agency to create a fellowship called the Right of Return Fellowship. So it gives uh, $20,000 grants to formerly incarcerated artists and it pairs them with organizations and mentors. So they're actually doing some institution building which, you know, that are like really in radical thoughtful ways that are about fostering communities and uh, professional de development among formerly incarcerated artists, in part because many artists, there's a whole history of imprisoned artists entering um, kind of auctions and markets as like outsider artists or folk artists, and often they haven't seen any profits around the kind of circulation of their work. So there is a movement um, among imprisoned artists and formerly imprisoned artists to, to really empower and to create structures and institutions of support. And part of it is peer mentoring, a really radical type of peer mentoring that's incredibly impressive. Um, and many of them have are exhibiting artists and just doing, uh, you know, making documentaries, doing all kinds of remarkable things. All right, I don't want this conversation to end, and I have so many, so many more questions that I know that our audience does too. But, um, but this is this is going to be the last one. Um, I think one of the big interventions of your book is that in the kind of popular and certainly the political imagination, um, people don't think about prisons as being a space of where there's really um, vital and vibrant art being created. And so um, this person asks, do you find that people have surprising reactions when asked to think about incarceration through the lens of art? And I just wanna add just in terms of like thinking about some of the stakes that we're talking about, like how might, um, 
the this art help us to bring about those transformations that you that you talked about i think it was really important the distinction you made like you're not um you know put, you're, not, you're not trying to like soften uh how terroristic and horrific um these institutions are but how but you know like how might art lead us eventually to bring about an end to human caging as you call for at the end of the book and i really have to say that like and I, this is not um I, I don't mean this in um in flowery terms that like literally people in captivity are making works to envision freedom to envision a way forward to, to literally envision futurity. And, and, you know, like there's one artist who's now out, but his name is Indume. And Indume, Indume Olutushami, his story is just like remarkable and how horrifying it, it is. He's from Missouri. He was put on death row in Tennessee, where he was on death row for 27 years. The first time he arrives in Tennessee is when he's being, going, being, um, going to court. He was charged for a crime in Tennessee. He had never been to the state. Mm -hmm. And he's on death row for 27 years. Um, and he literally says, I painted my way to freedom. He would paint, he would send his wor work to these, uh, to anti-capital punishment organizations. He, you know, and he just kept growing this community. He kept painting as a way of like, like I am still here. I'm going to be in community with people. And eventually he connected with people who connected with the pro bono attorney and got him out. And I'm not saying that's the story of everyone, but for a lot of artists, it really is like literally making something, creating their way to another possibility, creating, which is what ab abolition is like, creating a world that we have not seen. And I see artists doing that literally on micro levels, like creating a possibility that the state has taken from them. And, but refuting that state, the state sentence that, you know, this is going to be your life. This is your condemnation, right? Literally refuting that in the practice of making. And I do think, and I, you know, I, in my introduction said, there's a lesson here for us about really how we, survive the most austere and brutal conditions and how we come together across differences and how we resource pool and how we imagine and reimagine systems of value who is of value who can speak and who you know who 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 are we learning from in any in, in any given moment so, uh, so, but uh, do, do, are people surprised about, like, have, have you encountered people who are surprised about so, It's funny now, like, I, working on this for 10 years and the first four years having a series of no, 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 no's. Literally, like, no support. People are like, what are you talking about? Why are you elevating people in prison? I mean, like, a series of no's. And now, like, there's a 16-page spread about the project in art forum, in the printed, like, and it's, just a beautiful spread and all these artists are like this is beyond our wildest imaginations beyond this is like collective envisioning you know and there was something a beautiful piece in art america and you know and some of the people are saying that some of the most interesting art is happening in captivity or you know this is what some of the critics are saying and there was this really famous critic who's writing a review coming out this weekend who is, went to the exhibition was there for four hours he's been writing about art for literally 50 years and he's like this is the freshest art I've ever seen in my life. You know, like I've never seen a show like this. So there is a way that people are being radically like, I mean, I think there's a transformation because it, it is our own short, it's about our own limitations of what we imagine is the capacity of imprisoned people. And that's a penal logic. That's a carceral logic that has taught us that imprisoned people can't actually radically transform what we know to be art or what we know to be knowledge or what we know to be freedom. Like, and so that is us like being, you know, I think it's kind of lazy thinking on our part that's being radically challenged right now. Well, we only had an opportunity to scratch the surface, but I really encourage all of those out there, all our audience out there, if you have not read Marking Time and got your copy, please, order it from the Schomburg shop. It is truly, truly an amazing book that will stay with you for a while. Um, I just wanna bring Novella back 
Can I just say, Elizabeth, thank you. And I value you so much. I thank value you. you. So it's really an honor. It's no, an honor. Thank you. With you. Thank you. Thank you both for having your brilliance um, on display, for challenging us to not ignore the world around us. Uh, to talk about radical transformation um, and to also expand our imaginations around what people in all kinds of states are able to do. And I would say most importantly, to consider an abolition, um, the abolishment of caging systems across the country, across the, across the globe. I wanna thank everybody who has tuned in today. Uh, this is, like I said, the first day of the Schomburg Center Literary Festival. I hope that you will tune in the rest of the week. You can visit our site, SchomburgCenterLitFest.org. Um, I hope that you will pick up Nicole Fleetwood's book, Marking Time. You can get that at the Schomburg Center's shop. You can order it online at Schomburg Shop. Dot org. There is a special page created for the literary festival. So it has all of the books that are available um, before the festival and all of our programs that we are showing that we are hosting this week for the literary festival will be available and archived on livestream.com slash Schomburg Center. And so more of that information you will absolutely be able to access online via the Schomburg's website um, and the literary festival website. So you do not have to write it all down uh, at this moment. Again, thank you for your questions. Thank you for tuning in. And we are looking forward to seeing you hopefully tomorrow night for Audre Lorde, uh, Radical Care and Political Warfare. Have a good evening.